All right, folks. So here's a few things. They saw you talk about flashing firmware, and I was a little bit confused about its relevance for CCDC, but it is a very important thing, especially for the Internet of Things. Um, and probably the most obvious place where you do this is router firmware. The second thing is probably jailbreaking your iPhone and iPad. Um, it's all the same thing. You, these little devices have uh, firmware that starts them up, and the manufacturer's firmware gives you only the very basic uh, activities. And you can use OpenWRT is the only surviving product I know that's really doing very well here. And this lets you add all these extra features to your router. So you can do SSH tunneling or any other kind of VPN. So your, your router is now a server, and you can connect that way. You can run BitTorrent, and you can run any kind of server on it, like web servers and IRC servers. And you can do traffic shaping and QoS. And this is something that we need in the lab. We were talking about this. We now have a public IP unfiltered, going straight to the internet, which we can use for honeypots and such. But we're going to, if you do put in a honeypot and get it infected, you need to limit the upstream bandwidth so it doesn't attack people too much. And you can do that in the router, among other ways. Um, you can make a guest network. You can put sniffing software on them. You can put IDS software on them. And so one important issue with any of these firmware replacements is you can destroy your device. Um, if you put put up firmware and you put up the wrong version of firmware or something fails halfway through and you only get half the image up there, then the OS won't run and you can destroy it in various ways. Um, usually, even if you have a bad flash, it will still bring up the network adapter and perhaps even get an IP address. And then you can re-flash the firmware through the network port. But if you do it badly enough, it won't even bring up the network port at all. And then, um, if this was a Cisco router, you'd still be okay because it has special ports that let you directly in, like a console port and a serial port, and you can get in through those. But with a cheap home router, um, you don't have any of that hardware, so there's just no physical way to put data in the device anymore after the network card doesn't work. You, and the only you can't reset it because there's no firmware on there. Right? right, you can reset it, that will try to boot, and it won't be able to boot, and it'll just crash. Mm -hmm. So what you can do, um, you can solder in another component to add either a serial port or a JTAG to it. And uh, that's what, and JTAGs are the general solution here. But OpenWRT is actually very cool, and you can run it in VMware. I wrote up the instructions for it and put it on this page. Um, you can run it in a real router, but you can also run it in VMware. If you go to 140. Do they make a VMware image, or no. just install it? Uh, you have to install it. And there's a couple of little tricks. Let me get it running, and I'll talk about how I did it. Um, you have to have a virtual machine. How do you simulate the hardware? You don't. VMware recognizes yeah, it's x86. Oh. Oh. No, it doesn't recognize it. You tell it an x86 computer. The only thing it cares about is it has to be an x86 computer, it has to be an IDE hard drive, and it has to have two network cards. So this is OpenWRT. <coughs> oh, and even giving me a command prompt, which it didn't before, which is nice. So you can actually control it from there, which is pretty awesome. Um, but before, the way I had to control it, let me do it, my original setup, you had to control it from another virtual machine. And what's going on here? Yes, triple set. This is cocktails. All right. I'm losing my mind. All right. There, that's what I wanted. Now. Only this one. There. All right. The way this thing works, let me let me just talk about how I set it up. That's probably the best thing to do. All right. I found um, serial online tutorials that didn't work, and one that worked that was very terse. So what you do, you make a new virtual machine, and you have to make a custom one. You need to tell it it's Ubuntu 32-bit, and then make a new disk, and then you have to customize it and give it two gigs of RAM, which the router does not need. It only needs that for Ubuntu, which you're going to use briefly. And it needs to have an IDE hard drive, and um, you boot from a, a live CD. So you boot from a bunch of live disk, any kind of Linux would do. Then once you've got that going, now you can open a browser in the live CD so everything is happening in RAM. Now you download the firmware, open WRT, again in RAM, and unzip it. Now you can do FDisk and see what disk exists. And the disk that exists is dev SDA which I do not understand. It should be HDA for an IDE disk, but for some reason, Ubuntu interprets it as SDA, which would be SATA. And, and if you leave it as, as SCSI, which is the default, nothing works. You have to go and turn it into an IDE disk, but Ubuntu continues to refer to it as SDA. 
However, that works. So now you do a ghost image, which is actually cool. This file you've, down, you've downloaded was a zip file, and when you unzip it, you get a DD file, um, generic, and there it is. You get this file called .img. .img is just a flat image of the hard drive, bit for bit, just like a forensic copy. And all you have to do is DD it, copy it bit for bit onto the hard drive. So that's what this does. The op file is dev SDA, um, and that's, that's it. Now you just turn it off and restart it. And when you do... Did you find this from various sources and compile it in? Because yeah. it's a mess. You have to go to one and make it... Well, there, there was one very terse one that was almost right. But he skipped several things, yeah. like they always do. Yes, um, exactly. And so um, like now, so you get a, now the problem is you need to have another machine on the same network. Now, if you connect with bridged mode to the real network, the, the default IP address is 192.168.1.1. And if you're at a real network with an address like that, you're going to have an address conflict. Right. So I put it on NAT mode, and now I can't reach it from the host. So I have to run, I have to control my router from another virtual machine in NAT mode. Yeah. Would it help if you change your router's GCC pool to another IP address? It would, but you can't do that before you get in the first time. Oh. When you first flash it and boot it up. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Can so, you run bridging mode and stuff? Uh, you can put it in bridge mode, and that would work if your real network isn't using 192.168.1. Oh, that's okay. But it, almost everybody is. Anyway, so I control it from another virtual machine, and so I had a real address of 172.16.1.203 that really goes to the internet, and I need to also add a second address range to the same physical connection. So I have, you can manually add another address to it. By the way, um, the help page for ifconfig is wrong in Kali. Might as well get used to this. Like we, were, we were all supposed to quit using ifconfig 10 years ago. It was deprecated. Oh, but, but IP the many, address, so. The IP address, but somehow you can do it all with IP right. if you figure out. But anyway, you can do it if you specify the broadcast. So you put another address, and what this does, this multi-homes the adapter. So now you have eth0 and eth0 colon 0. If you haven't done this before, it's a good thing to know about. You can have virtual adapters. So now this adapter has two, it's connected to this network and also to that network. And now I can finally connect to 192 and 6811 and I can open it and see the joy of OpenWRT, which really is pretty swell. So let me why, see what I've got why here. Did you do a home year adapter? What's that? Why did you add a, a virtual? Because I have a real address that goes to the internet and I also have to have some address that will go to OpenWRT and they're in different address ranges. But they're both on the same physical network. I mean, my OpenWRT is. This was a trick, it took me a little while to get it straight. The OpenWRT has two adapters, but they're both just going to NAT. Now in principle, one should go to the internet, one should go to your local network of machines if you actually set it up like a router. But right now I have them both just going to NAT because I don't want either of them conflicting with the real network. And so this, I need some way to get to NAT. So I have a machine here that's connected to NAT. And if I do ifconfig, um, this is whatever you get around here for the real network. Um, and so I need to add that address. It's ifconfig uh, eth1 add 192.168.1.101 broadcast. OK. That should do it. Now ifconfig should show that I have that eth1 0. So now I should be able to reach that other device. Yeah, I just give it anything that's not 1. OK. And now if I open Ice Weasel, I should be able to go to. 192.168.1.1. There we are. And I, I previously gave it a password. Okay. And this is actually fantastically nice. I was playing with it. This is why you really want to play with this. Um, it, you do have command line Linux. You can just do everything there. Um, but you, it's really very nice what you can do in the GUI. You can set your firewall here to do whatever you like. Here's your. This is obviously just IP tables. Um, if you recognize these rules in a graphics, and I've got that before in IPv6, you've got running processes here, which are very typical Linux processes. It's running NOCD. So apparently it's got port knocking available, which by default, which is a bit extreme. NOCD. NOCD is. Um, yeah. PID. So NOCD is a port knocking thing. Uh, oh, K-block D. Maybe I just didn't see the right thing. Anyway, um, what I thought was pretty interesting, this is just general information, but system administration lets you control this thing from the GUI. And down here, you can define your SSH keys, but the thing I really liked was adding more software to it. 
which I may have to go look at my slides to figure out where it is. Software, here we are. Okay, this is basically a graphical interface for apt-get. Here's the installed packages, and I'm sort of interested whether they already have Canuck D installed. I thought they did, maybe they saw something that looked like it. Yeah, all right. And then you can add more here, um, available packages. And they're all just right here. You can download them and bring them in, and everything you could possibly want is here to run. And I made a list of the ones I thought were interesting on the slides. Um, so we'll talk, get back to that. Oh, just a moment. I'm putting, maybe it's in my, my instructions page. Yeah, it is. All right. Yes, yeah, so here's where you add software. First, you have to uh, click something to update the lists, which just does an apt get update, or whatever the equivalent is for this version of Linux. And here's the packages that I thought were good. Um, you got DNS crypt, which is probably going to be a hit. I've been unable to actually make it work in any real situation yet, but theoretically, it's supported by. Um, Open DNS, and this is the one that actually addresses a real privacy concern. It encrypts your requests and responses on your local area network, which is something that DNSSEC will not do. So there's been a lot of, but when I found it, I couldn't find any client that ran on any normal operating system that worked. I tried to assign it for homework in my 120 class, and there's nothing that works. There's stuff that says it works in Windows, and it totally doesn't work. Open DNS supposedly provides the server, but I can't find any clients that exist. It, the specification has been around for a while, but it hasn't caught on. If people actually understood how much DNS was telling everybody everything you're doing, there would probably be some interest in developing this product. But anyway, it's here. You can set it up on your router, um, and that would be almost as good. Then you can, your router could get, resolve everything with encryption, and then the traffic would only be on your local network instead of going all the way off to some server. Yeah? If you're in contact with the people that are making DNS crypt, you should tell them they should join uh, Google Summer Code, because if they make some documentation, they'll get it students to like build them a client over the summer. Yeah, that's I don't know anything about people making it. It's a thought. Um, I mean, somebody has to make software. So. Well, I think they made the server and they hoped that like people who made operating systems would care and they didn't. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, but as people, I think thanks to the NSA and Snowden, people are now much more concerned about privacy. So maybe they'll get concerned enough to actually begin to think about the fact that you really don't want every URL you go to broadcast to the whole world constantly. <laughs> But they, they probably just don't know that's happening. Then you got EB tables, which I thought was pretty interesting, a layer two firewall, um, which is something I thought we might need to, sh to share out our only public IP address in um, S214, among the many honeypots, although it occurred to me you could also just do everything with port forwarding. Um, anyway, uh, single packet authorization, FWK NOC, this is the improved version of um, NOC D. This, there used to be this old thing called port knocking which is in my classes, where you have, you send a packet on like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and that opens 22 for a few seconds. So you can make connections, but only if you know the magic knock. This is the more modern version where you send a single packet, and it contains an encrypted payload, which is encrypted with something like AES or public key encryption, and that magic packet is what opens it, single packet authorization. Um, anyway, you got VPN, you got a load balancer here. If you want to use your router as a load balancer in front of a group of servers, and you have Quagga. Quagga is what um, we used to use something called Viata in the lab, which is a virtual router. And this OpenWRT in VMware could just as well be used as a virtual router. If you put on Quagga, you get all the things a Cisco router does. RIP, um, OSPF, and all that jazz. So you can run enterprise class routing tables. The problem is, of course, your router probably doesn't have the hardware to do high performance of anything, but anyway, you certainly have the software. You can put on a Snarch, you can put on a Sox proxy. Sox proxies are very strange. If you've used Tor, it's a Sox proxy. Sox proxies come, were developed a really long time ago before network address cancellation. Mm -hmm. And people had trouble sharing internet connections, they use things like WinSOC. Yes. And a Sox proxy connects at like layer five or something screwy. But the important thing is it's not the usual kind of encapsulation. The, the reason why SOX proxies continue to exist is it is very easy to connect a machine so 100% of your traffic goes through the proxy. And other proxies don't really do that, and VPNs don't really do that, and that's why they really don't work for some privacy thing like Tor. That's why there was a big expose about a year ago testing almost all VPNs don't work. 80% of them, if you just install them on your phone or something and use them, not all the traffic goes through the VPN. Something super important, like the DNS resolution, just goes right out in plain text without being encrypted, which is really defeating the entire purpose. So anyway, um, 
Then you've got traffic control. This is what I use. TC is the Linux traffic control. You can use this to limit your bandwidth and many other things. But that's what I do. I just have a, a cron job that every minute or 10 minutes sets the bandwidth of the outgoing connection back to 100 kilobits per second so that when people keep hacking my server, they can't really do too much harm with it because you can't really do a DOS flood or brute force attack very fast without much upstream bandwidth. And uh, you got, by the way, I've made the THC IPv6 entire suite is available for OpenWRT. And that's what I took to DEF CON several times. There were a ton of IPv6 attacks that freeze and crash systems and deny service. And you can put yourself in the middle trivially with IPv6 neighbor discovery packets. You can freeze people off the network. You can do lots of cool stuff with IPv6. And all those things are right there. And then you have Wi-Fi Dog, which will make a captive portal so you can share your stuff and separate the traffic from others and limit their bandwidth and have people log in with a password and run, use your open WRT to make a coffee house with a private network and, and a, where people only get some limited features. And there's a lot of other stuff. So I thought, that's pretty cool. You might want to play with that. Um, but that's one example of what you get by flashing firmware. And the whole point of this game is you can take your hardware and make it do strange things the manufacturer did not let fry you. Uh, so you are taking risk of destroying your device, as we said. And if you want to install it, there are four ways to put this on your router. If you have, you have already some router, some firmware that came from the manufacturer, a link list. It will have somewhere on there a link to update the firmware. Now, some of the older ones, you'll have an option to just update the firmware from a file you downloaded. And you can just point it to the DDORT file and it will just put it on, because all it's doing is DD, that file onto the router. Now, the modern ones are beginning to have like signatures which is a pretty good idea, and require that it's actually signed by the manufacturer. So you cannot use their proprietary uh, firmware flasher to flash it to something they didn't make, which is probably a good idea in general, but you have to defeat it. So if you want to defeat that, you have to do the same kind of stuff you'd do if you bricked your router, by fouling up the upload. So you destroyed the existing firmware and you put it on something that didn't work, then there are some cute tricks. Um, you, can, you boot it and you try to connect either through Ethernet or serial port if you have one. And one thing, I remember we bricked a router completely. We, I did this a lot about seven years ago because we were trying to do IPv6 work in the real early days. And nothing supported IPv6. So the first thing we did was try to get a router to support IPv6. And we had to add all these tables and the command lines. We had to first get open source firmware on it. And so we bricked it completely. And I couldn't figure out what to do. But one day I just turned it on and I was sniffing on Wireshark. And it puts out a UDP packet when you first boot it up. And I said, wow, what's that? And I looked it up. That is by design. If you totally destroyed the thing, when you boot it up, it will send out one packet during boot up, and you have like five seconds. If you answer, it will now take firmware through the interface. Oh. Assuming that you've this, I think it was true of Cisco routers. Remember, they have the they have this ROM, and then they have they have this um, basic system, and then there's an even more basic system underneath it in case you trashed everything that will still make it possible. I remember um, in Cisco routers, you could come in through the serial port if all else fails, and it will take like two hours to upload the firmware. But it's it's better than having to like throw it in the trash can. And um, I did that a few times because uh, the Cisco instructions for the basic projects encourage students to use commands where if they make one typo, they destroy the router completely, mm -hmm. which is kind of harsh. RM. Yeah, that, it was RM or something like that. You do, you're moving something and if you, if, you, if you miss a space or something, it wipes out all the firmware, something like that. Yeah, I remember that. So you teach lesson one and you go to lesson two and half the routers don't work anymore, you know what happened. Same anyway, thing so, Anyway, and then of course, when all this fails, you put on a JTAG, and I have some, uh, uh, I found a PowerPoint about JTAGs. These things are supposedly fantastic. Um, I've not used them, but people say they are to catch me out. If you have, what these do is they let you put memory directly in the ROM chip. So it's a joint test action group. They defined a standard to test firmware, firmware chips that hold it. So um, this started in 90, uh, and so the point of this is you can now sample the lines on the device to debug the firmware on the real hardware. And there you can chuck out the firmware with a JTAG and you can put it back in with a JTAG. And this is why hardware hackers love them. Because if you have some gadget, like a thermostat or something, and they don't give you the firmware, you can't even download it, you can connect a JTAG and suck the firmware out the chip. Then you can use OBSDump, or not OBSDump, um, BINWALK. BINWALK is the main tool for Linux, which will open up the firmware and let you see it. BINWALK, by the way, is something good to know for CTFs. Um, but anyway, this, and there are more and more hardware hacking uh, flashing in the CTFs these days, where you'll get firmware from some device that you have to figure out how to use. Anyway, that's the game here. So it's a serial protocol, and you, um, you connect to this thing, 
everything has a JTAG port. You usually haven't bothered to solder anything to it, but the board typically has it. So you can just solder in some wires and connect to a JTAG, which is why it's cool. And um, there are many different versions of it. Once you get it on there, you're stuck at 100 megahertz. Um, so it's not super fast, but you can connect to parallel or USB or anything, and you can suck out the firmware, you can push up new firmware. So this is how you can restore a completely bricked device, as long as you can make some firmware that works. And they have various interfaces to debug it. GDB is one way, there are other things. So like say, you can reflash your boot firmware. If you totally destroy the thing and it won't even boot up, you can put up a new bootloader. Obviously, you can put up a malicious bootloader, root kits, all sorts of good things. They call them boot kits in this case, where you have a root kit on an embedded device. So every time it restarts, it does evil. And even if you reflash the firmware, it'll continue to do evil because you replaced the bootloader, which is what you want to do. And you can totally do that stuff with your router too. You can make routers that add malware to every download, routers that sniff all the passwords and send them to a third party. And, and that stuff is really out there. Uh, for the last couple of years, there's been a bunch of router botnets. Um, one, another one just last week of uh, 10,000 routers being controlled. Before that, someone took over, I think, 100,000 routers and used it to scan the whole internet about two years ago. This is a, it's just a whole Linux box, and you can usually get root on it with a trivial exploit, and they're all just really out there, and nobody will ever, ever know. They'll, the internet will be slightly slower, but you can just take them over and use them forever, and no one will even know what's happened because there's no antivirus and there's no interface and the average user never even knows what's going on in their router. So you could be in there for a really long time and nobody would ever know. So that's the game. And there are files you can set up that control this stuff as you define your firmware. So anyway, that's what I wanted to show you about flashing things. Uh, and it's a very similar process if you want to jailbreak your iPhone or iPad and, and put on open source firmware or your Android. Did you do that? Yeah. Did you have jailbroken? Yeah. Yeah, I jailbroken on. Um, I used Green Poison to jailbreak an iPad. And then I put on more and more goofy wait, software. And then I got. To jailbreak an iPhone or an iPad? I did it to an iPad. Okay. And then what happened, I wanted to change the MAC address of the iPad. That was my goal. And I couldn't find any software that would do it. So I finally put on a MAC address changing software from like a four generation previous iPhone. And that finally bricked it, so it wouldn't even boot up because that's completely insane. Mm -hmm. But before that, I got it to where I could compile C on the iPad and stuff. And then, um, okay. and then when I then I recovered it with the um, backup in iTunes. And after that, I had a strange mutant with the original software mixed with. Because all happened is it came back up, but the MAC address finally changed. <laughs> and that's when I said, "Wait a minute! I just recovered it from the backup. It should be 100% back to normal." That's when I realized the iTunes backup is not a DD image. I just assumed it was. It's a backup. No, that's why, that's why Apple tells you, if you jailbreak it, we will never speak to you again. We hate your guts because our repair tools will no longer work because Mac backup does not back up 100% of the storage. It just backs up the folders that they think you're authorized to mess with. It doesn't back up the other folders. And after you mess with them, when you restore it, some of the old stuff is there and some of the new stuff mixed. So now I have an iPad with God knows what software that changed the Mac address and a bunch of other stuff is still left on there. <laughs> So anyway, um, so they're not kidding when they tell you, you know, you've ordered your warranty, don't speak to us again after you do this. Um, but that's, anyway, um, so I got other things we should talk about here. I'll put them up there. Oh, the other thing I wanted to show you was this format string um, solution. I wrote it up and it was good, clean fun. Um, I, and it's quite useful because there's another um, CTF, two CTFs going on today, we'll be doing it in the afternoon, and one of them has this vulnerability. I got this far and I didn't proceed any further, leaving it for somebody else. So here's from last week's CTF. Um, here's the problem. They don't give you any hints or anything. All they give you is a server and an, on a port number to connect to. This is the standard deal. You can connect to that server and find some kind of software and they give you the binary so you can run it locally. It's called judgment. So you download this binary. Um, whenever you download a binary, it's almost always zipped and you have to unzip it. Then the first thing you do is file. File will tell you what it is. So file tells me it is a... Um, 32-bit executable, I think. Yeah, 32-bit executable, which I'm somehow not seeing in this result. There, ELF 32-bit, there. There's 32-bit Linux executable file. So, my first step, which I highly recommend whenever I get a binary, is to get pseudocode. It doesn't matter if it's Windows or Linux, doesn't matter if it's 32 or 64-bit. You get Hopper, which runs natively on the Mac, and it runs on 64-bit Linux. I have a virtual machine with Hopper installed. And so, Hopper 
you can load, ex load any file and then it will give you the labels and the strings. And the strings are usually the most fun place to start because the labels include all the code that comes with the operating system, which is usually, usually you're not looking for bugs in the operating system, you're looking for co bugs in the code <coughs> that somebody wrote. So these are all the strings. So the strings are all in one place and the strings appear here with the addresses where they're stored and there's cross references to where they are. So this is how you find out what modules there are in the code. And what I have is there's something called init, something called main, and something called load flag. Uh, this, by the way, is another thing that it helps to know from lore almost a very common capture the flag thing is they have some kind of binary which um, takes some kind of input and there's some way to put in malicious input and it loads the flag as a file from the local system and there's some way to get it to print out the flag. And so when you run it on your local system, it will crash because you need a file called flag. So you need to make a file called flag.txt and put some random stuff in it, just so it'll run, and you can practice stealing your fake flag. And then when you get on the real server, that exploit will show you the real flag. This is the standard thing. Anyway, so this load flag obviously is what loads the flag, and there's main. And this init is probably something from the system that doesn't really matter. But anyway, the point is, um, on the top right is the all-important button. This is the button that writes pseudocode, which is the greatest thing in the world it turns it back into C, more or less. It's not perfect C, but it's pretty good, so you don't have to really read assembly very much. You can just read C. You have to get into the module, which you do by double-clicking these to move into where that, that uh, text is actually used, and then you get the pseudocode module by module, and there you go. So here's the pseudocode for load flag. And here's what it looks like. It's a little screwy. It's kind of cruel C, but the trick to all this stuff is to look at stuff you can understand. Like here's the flag, printing something failed. Here it is trying to load, calling a load flag routine, printing something that fails. This is in it. It calls load flag, prints something that fails, and then it returns otherwise. By the way, this um, stack check fail stuff is automatically generated, I think, by the compiler. You see it all the time. Um, everything has a cookie at the end of the stack. At the start of it, it puts a value into it, chosen from a special register that's random. And then at the end, it checks to make sure it's still that random value to stop simple buffer overflows. So it's not surprising that that's there. And usually, this procedure is essentially perfect. You're not going to succeed in doing a buffer overflow in the presence of these stack cookies. You have to find a different attack that works. So now, I went, went to load flag. Load flag just loads it. One thing that I noticed here is it doesn't put the name of the flag file anywhere. Not obviously, it's not a string. So I thought we might actually be in trouble. I might have to like put it in debugger and stop it halfway through and hunt around trying to figure out the name of the file that the flag is in. But the error code produced by the problem tells you that you need a flag, tells you it's flag.txt, which is handy. So the next thing is, I looked at main. And if you look at main, you immediately see this highlighted line. That is the end of the game right there. That is a format string vulnerability. In C, when you print things, you must include a format string. I thought it's funny when I learned about this because I programmed C for years and it never occurred to me to do this wrong. I didn't even know you could. When you use printf, you have a format string that tells it what to print and you put in there these percent things which tell it where to put the data and then you put the variable over here and that's percent s is where it puts the data. So that's the right way to do it. But you can omit this and just print things and then it will print in some default format. And I never knew this. If I had known it, I probably would have written code all full of this problem. But anyway, People that know that, they do that occasionally because they just can't be bothered. And if you do that even once, you're screwed if the user controls that data. Because now it prints something, which it turns out is something the user put in, and the user can insert the format string. Because it doesn't care. Yeah? So if they put that, the print without the options anywhere, they could be buffer overflow just easily? It's not a buffer overflow. It's a different vulnerability called uh, format string. Lack of a format string. Format string vulnerability. It's been known since about 2001. And it is very interesting. And it's very fun to play with. And we did quite a bit in the, so first I had to add a flag.txt file, because if you just run it, it'll say loading flag.txt failed, which is very friendly of them. Now I know the name of the file to make. So I just put 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, in a file called flag.txt, and now it runs. So now it can read data. So if I put in ABC, see this is, you put in the flag, it tells you if you're right. So you put in ABC, it does wrong flag. Okay, that's fine. And of course, this tells me pretty much what's going on now. This means it takes more data and compares it to the flag, and if it's not equal, it puts it there. Therefore, the flag is somewhere in memory. So I just need to find some way to read the memory where the flag is. Yeah? I'm kind of lost sight of what's, what are you trying to do like, ultimately? Uh, this is a capture the flag competition, so oh, you're okay. trying to find something called flag. Yeah. Okay. And, and so um, the next thing, if this is true, that you have a format string vulnerability, then instead of putting in an answer, you put in a format. And what you typically do is percent x dot, percent x dot, 
because if it won't break up the way spaces would break it up, and percent x is a format. And if this works, you will now get the contents of the stack, byte by byte. I mean, word by word. So these are 32-bit words off the stack. First one's eight, then B77, then B77. That's a format string vulnerability. And so with the way format string, for if you use a percent x, it will print the hexadecimal value on the stack. And you can have as many as you want, and it'll just print the whole contents of the stack. Then if you put in percent %s, it will interpret these as pointers and print the string they point to. And if you use percent %n, which is the strangest format in the world, it will write to that memory location in the print statement. And what it will write is the number of bytes that have been printed so far by the whole program. Everyone in the world has no idea why this thing even exists. As far as I know, the only purpose of it is to take over machines. But what this means is you now have arbitrary read and arbitrary write of memory. So, um, now I have, uh, this is a project I went through that I got from the uh, shell code book that shows how to do this, where well, now what you do to take over a machine is you inject, a, you inject code and you run the code you injected. If you can insert something like three or 400 characters, then you can do that. So I started that process. Now the first step in that process is to find out how to control one of the values on the stack. So you put in some letters like A, 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 then you put in a bunch of percent X's because this goes into a variable. They're reading something from the user and putting it in a variable. It's somewhere on the stack. But I don't know how far down the stack it is. And for real format string vulnerabilities, for real commercial software, it's often like 361 <coughs> words up the stack. So I just put in maybe 14 of these. So I put in four A's, then I'm printing out the content of the stack. I'm looking for those A's, which would be 41, 41, and I don't see them anywhere. So it's not in the first 10 or 12 elements on the stack. Then I tried a longer one with like 28, and now I got some really bad news. It only took part of it, and the other part just hung off here. So I have a limit in the length of what I can put in, and the limit is pretty small, like 60 or 80 characters. That means I cannot take over the box because I can't have enough bytes to put in shell code. Um, so that's going to greatly limit how much damage I can do with this vulnerability. But I can print part of the stack, but also I cannot see the A's I objected. They go somewhere too high for me to reach. Now that I can fix. There is another way, another format, which again, I don't know why it exists, but you can do percent %40 X. And what that will do is move to the 40th item and print it in hex. So you don't have to have 40% X's in a row. This is what you do, 40, 41, 42, 43. You can refer to them by number. And so I print it, this is the 40s, 41, 42, and 43, and finally I find it. So the stuff I put here ends up in the 43rd word on the stack. So other variables in the stack before it. So now I can control something on the stack by putting it here. So now I can inject an address into that location. The problem is, um, all right. So I view the assembly code. Here's the assembly code for the main function. Because um, the way this works, see the next step is, the way you do a format string vulnerability, now you can write to memory. You can write, say, one byte to memory by controlling how many bytes you printed up to 255. So you can write one byte four times. You can write a 32-bit address into memory somewhere. Now, that might not sound like much, but what you do is you write, when a program runs, it calls various routines. So let me go back to my original C code. Okay, so this thing does printf stack, then it does string compare. Then it does uh, stack check fail, it does put s down here. So if I, there's a thing called the global offset table. Um, you, when you call a system routine, like um, put s, you don't directly call the address of put s. You call an offset table, which then points to put s. It's just, I think, more convenient for compilers to keep up with the changes in the versions of operating systems and stuff that way, to have a layer of indirection. So you can change the offset table. So the pointer to put s points to something else, hopefully code I injected. And then when the program calls put s, it will run my code instead of the real code. That's the most common way to take over a machine through um, format string vulnerabilities. So for it to work, you have to have a function call and you have to have some other function that's called later. And right here, it does a printf and then it does a string compare. So if I can just overwrite the string compare variable, I can do it. And that would be fine. So I have to find it. Um, the string compare. So first I look at my uh, disassembled code just to see what's here. So here is where it um, calls printf. That prints out something say input flag. Here's where it reads the input. Here's where the format string vulnerability is. It prints something out. And here's where I call string compare. So I'm going to try and overwrite string compare. Now, to see the uh, dynamic relocation record, you just use obj dump, which is included in every version of Linux by default, as far as I can tell. It's used for legitimate debugging. 
This will print out the relocation table, and here's where everything is. Every function the thing uses is here, and there's an address of where it is. And you see the table just counts right up here. So 0804, A, and a series of things going up from 9 through A. And someplace here is string compare, here. So I need to write to this address, 0804A010. And if I do that, I can redirect code. Now, normally what I do is I inject a whole shell that I get from like Metasploit, and then I would jump to that shell. In this case, because I only have about 80 characters, I can't put in a shell. But what I thought I could do is I could just put in the address of the code that prints the flag. Jump over the compare and go to the part that says you win. That would be a simple enough answer. I don't really need to inject code. I just need to make it skip a line, like to bypass a product key. And that's like the simplest kind of injection. But I'm, in order to do it, I need to write to that address. And this is where I get a really nasty a wake up call. So I make up an exploit to how it will do this, which is uh, printing the address 0804A010 backwards, and then the dollars X percent in. Um, this is the code that the percent n is what's going to write into it. So this will write just random garbage into that address. And I'm going to make sure it works. And when I tried to run it, it said unprintable character. And I said, oh, I'm not allowed to put in stupid characters like 08 and 04. But if I can't do that, I can't point to anywhere in memory. This is really serious. And so now I went and tried them. I found I, found I could do it this way. I can just echo dollars quote 01 into the program. And it'll say in unprintable character 02. I tried them all. Everything that's not a printable ASCII character is forbidden, all the way from 1 to 20 in, in hex. And that means I can't point to anything starting 0804, which means I can't point to any of the code because the real program starts at 0804. I can't hit the global offset table. I'm really hosed. I can't write to any useful location, and I can't write any useful addresses even to the locations I can hit. So basically, I can't use the format string write ability at all. But it occurred to me, I can still read. And so the next question is, where is the flag anyway? So I went back to this code. It, it calls string compare here. Um, I put a breakpoint here. Right after this line, this is uh, main plus 124 is here. Here's the format string. I put a breakpoint here and run it in debug. My goal was, I'm going to let it read something go past the format string injection, and now I want to say at this point, where is the flag? The flag is somewhere in memory. And see if I can somehow read that location. So um, I put a flag of ABC, the program hits the break point, the info registers show me the values, and I just printed out the stack, and I found, now remember up here, the way this works, it's going to do the string compare, and it loaded this address, 0804A0A0, into this location on the stack pointer. See, the way program system calls work is you call a function like print or compare, and the stack contains the arguments. The first argument will be pointed to the string compare is two arguments, one string compared to another. The first thing on the stack is the first string to compare its address, the next thing is the second string to compare. So one of the strings it's comparing is this, 804A0A0. That might be where the flag is. So I wanted to print memory and see if that value is on the stack, and it is. There it is. So. 28 words down on the stack is that value. So that means all I need is this, percent $28x. That will print the address 804A0A0. And if I change that to $28S, it will now print the string it points to, which is the flag. And that's it. Now all you have to do is connect to their server and put in that exploit, $28 S, and you get the flag. So it's interesting. And that's format string vulnerabilities. They've been around forever, and they seem to be real hot in capturing the flags. By the way, one thing that should probably not be a surprise to you is these things go by fashionable trends. After somebody does this, probably in something influential like DEF CON, all the CTFs have pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so every CTF I've been looking at for a long time got format string vulnerabilities now. and so. Um, we got this canonical information how to exploit them in the 127 class in the project I linked to. This one here, I really only needed about half of the usual format string stuff. But I didn't really know you could use percent %s to print the string it points to. I had, that was new to me, and that was actually pretty cool. That makes it much more powerful than I thought it was. Anyway, um, so I wanted to show you that. Let me see what else is on my agenda. Oh, and then I wanted to talk about CTFs. 
So I think if we get more organized, we can do better on CTFs. And we have a good opportunity today, which is why I want to spend, I'll spend all day in the lab working on this, because D did these two CTFs last year and they were so hard we didn't get any points at all. And I think we can do better. So, and I think it also applies to the CCDC. So here is my proposal. Um, and I welcome comments. But it seems to me, I, I've been doing CTFs for a couple of years here, and I've noticed the same problem, which is typically I feel all alone. I don't get, uh, nobody answers any emails. Um, <laughs> nobody, nobody, I have no idea if anybody else is even playing or what they're doing. And this is clearly not the way to win. And I've, even, I've heard from CCDC, they say the, the most important person on the team is the non-technical manager. That's what actually makes you succeed. The same thing at a company. You can have a lot of smart people hacking away all day, but it's the manager that makes sure that we're actually getting something done that is worth money. And so um, I th this is my thought, is we need people like this. We need people, now people might be beginners, where all they know is the content of a course. And that doesn't mean they're useless, but it means they can only do the easier challenges. Um, then you have experts in technical skills that have some knowledge beyond the course in these things, like some specialty, like exploit development or something like that. Uh, there are also people who have connections. They have to have a lot of friends that know that they can call and ask interesting questions and things like that. But management is another issue. Somebody who can actually lead people without insulting them and frustrating them. Because, you know, if managers always making you quit doing the fun thing and go to some boring meeting, that's useless. That's what everybody hates. But on the other hand, it would be a whole lot better if there was some kind of organization. So my plan is before the game starts, you should be able to do things like find write-ups of previous games and learn... Um, Useful tips, for example, a C CTF. Everything is zipped with this goofy X zip format, and then inside there is a tar file. So I only found that out last year by looking at the previous year's write-ups. Before that, I didn't know how to unzip anything, and you're dead in the water. Um, then you should have, you should know who's actually playing and have some way to communicate quickly. Some people are talking about a Slack channel. Some people sent me something else they've never heard of. They invent a new social network every day, and somebody thinks it's the greatest thing. Yeah. So um, anyway, I don't care what it is, but there has to be some way to communicate with team members, and it has to be so that not random people can just join. That was a, a big bone of contention last semester when they found out just everybody was getting a CCSF hackers mailing list, which means that someone from an opposing team could be in there stealing our flags. Now, I never worried about it, and I'm still not worried about it, because we have no assets. We're not winning the competition. They don't have anything to steal right now. But at some point, presumably, we will start pulling ahead, and then we'll have something to protect. So I'm thinking maybe going back to that is the thing to do. But anyway, um, there has to be some way to get progress reports so you know what's going on. And the manager should be able to make some kind of chart like this. Here are the problems. And somebody should take a quick look at all the problems to decide, like, are there any quick tips? And they should just know what's going on, who's doing what, and where are they? Are they making some progress? Are they stuck? Do they need help? Things like that. And there ought to be some way to ask for help. That this, I think, would be a whole lot better. Just like in a business. You're working on this, you're working on that. Um, and there has to be somebody watching the recon. One thing they have in every CTF is they have an IRC channel where people are chatting and there are tips in there and they very often have like a news board and they very often tell you things like the binary was broken, you'll never find the flag, there's an updated binary, which you might not notice. You might be spending your whole time working on something that can't work and things like that. So somebody has to be doing that. I never have time to do that and I never always miss all that information. Um, and then there are often um, people, even people who are not technical experts, can help on the flags because they can search for it. There are some tricks, like one thing I learned from another student last semester. Tom told me the thing to do is search for part of the flag and then put CTF, and you will find previous CTFs with similar problems, and pre up some previous CTFs with similar problems, and I never thought of that. I would just Google the technical thing and find like tutorials and textbook pages and stuff, because that's what I think of. But there's tricks, and so there's, there's there's three ways I notice people get stuck. The first thing is you can't start. This is what typically happens to me on the web puzzles. They give you some address, you go to a login page, there's no clue, I'm like stuck. I don't even know what to do. There appears to be absolutely nothing to do here. There's, I don't even know what attack to try. Uh, there's no cookie, I, nothing in burp, I, uh, I'm stuck. Whatever I'm supposed to think of here, I don't know it. Now I know a little more. You should run Nikto on the server, to be that, but I don't know a whole lot more. And so this is the first thing. Can't start. There's, I've got a lockbox. There's no door at all. And then you just need brainstorming from people. And again, it's not necessarily terribly technical. You need people that just have heard of things or read things or read the news and have some idea. What do you do now? Um, then stuck partway is very common. You find some vulnerability. You get in, but you can't find the flag. So you're, you're, uh, 
you're on the wrong track or you need a tip how to exploit it. Like that format string, that's where you spend most of my time. I find the vuln, I get in, and now I just try doing what I know how to do with it and that doesn't work and now I'm going to see what else can you do with this. And uh, then stuck in the end is another issue. You find the flag and the game server won't take it. This happens very often. Um, often the flag format is screwy. Often their game servers don't work very well. And often, unfortunately, they put fake flags in, which is what already happened to me this morning in one that's run right now. Um, so there's a thing there that looks like a flag and it's not a flag, which is very rude. But anyway, um, so the technical experts are the people that most of us like start out wanting to be. And I think Pilot, I, I actually I welcome comments, but I also think we should have half time when we quit and all go together and like have a meal or something where you stop. Because one thing that is super important is to quit and get a fresh start because the most common progress of a CTF is you find a problem, you find a vuln, you chew in the vuln, you work on this, you work on that, then it gets complicated, then you study something for an hour, then you try something more complicated, more complicated, and all the time you're on the wrong road. You're never going to get there. You need to stop completely and try again from the start. Um, and I think this would be better also make people have more fun. And the other thing we totally need to do, which we have not been doing, is um, after it's over, we need to have a review of what we did, we need to write up what we were able to solve so that we increase our knowledge and so we make an archive of knowledge. So the things that need to happen is we need to have a communication method and we need to have a way to archive all our results. Now you can do it the totally public way. You can go to CTF time and make an account and put your write-ups up there, but maybe we would prefer to make it private. One thing I know that is uh, to stop me is of course the winning teams put up write-ups and usually I write it before I put one up, but I don't care. We need to make our own write-ups. That's how we can exchange knowledge with, because then we can talk to the person that wrote them up and we'll have our own tricks. Reading other people's stuff is good, but we need to get in the habit of doing our own because the process of exchanging information within our group is going to make us all stronger. And I think we're missing a lot of the value of these things by not finishing this way. And we're never going to be a winning team until we have this kind of organization or something like it. Yeah? Sir, do, you, do we have a current list of all the upcoming and current CTFs? I put them on my webpage as soon as they come up. Now, I go to get them all from CTF time. So ctftime.org puts them up, but they usually only put them up about three weeks in advance. Okay, How compete all? Uh, I compete in all the ones that are available. Okay. Yeah, and I also now that we've done it for a whole year, we have previous experience, so I know how hard they are. A few of them are really easy and very popular, like Easy CTF is great, goes for a whole week, yeah. and the problems are much easier, so we can get a lot of points, and sometimes we're even winning that one. Um, the one at DefCon is so hard, I've even given up on it. Uh, <laughs> maybe in another year, it'll be worth trying again. Um, the two today. We're so hard, we got zero points last year in both of them. But I think we can do better. And I was going through them last night, this morning, and I saw several look pretty promising. So I think if we get organized like this, we should at least solve a couple. But realistically, I would think if we can get one or two solved in these two CTFs today, that would be enough success. That's all we can reasonably care, expect. But we should be able to do that. Um, You've been successfully yeah. using Slack for some of these points, stumbling into yeah. them. Well, I think so Slack's a good place for that because we can have some private channels. And yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Ben was always the one that instigated a lot of that, and yeah. he's busy. And that's why, that's why we need to get organized, because we've been, these things have been, like most open source projects, if you're relying on just one or two people, and we need to like get to where, like, like for a club to survive, the same thing has to happen. You have to have a way to move the leadership to another person, appoint somebody, we have to make it so they're not stuck there forever to burn out, but it can be moved to another person. And also, people need to move through these, and you remember, the exciting thing about CCDC is it's very relevant to a real work. And it's just what you're going to do on the job. And the other thing you're really going to do on the job is lead a small team of workers as their local manager. These is another thing really good to practice, is because it's hard to be a manager. I mean, as a kid growing up, I noticed that all, parents and in general adults in general were just idiots, always in my way with stupid problems, messing up my life. And most people hate their boss because it's hard to be a good boss. You have to somehow tell people what to do, and if you are clumsy, or stupid about it, they hate your guts because they're doing something, you keep making them quit doing what they ought to be doing and do something stupid instead. So it's a very good thing to practice being a manager and learn how to do it, how to respect people, how to help them accomplish things instead of like making them do what you want them to do, which is a different thing. <laughs> anyway, it's like raising kids. You can make them do 100% of what you do or you can just try to make them healthy and happy doing something reasonable. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna stop this recording and uh, that's all I got about that stuff. And then I think we ought to go start playing these things. This is uh, 140, chapter 3, I think.